Buddha said there are four reasons why people are afraid of death. One is that they're attached to sensual pleasures. And they're afraid that at death they'll be deprived of their sensual pleasures. And others are they're attached to the body. And they know that at death they'll have to leave the body. The third is that they've done cruel and harmful things in their life. And they're afraid of the possibility that they may be punished for those cruel and harmful things after death. And the fourth is that they have doubts about the true Dharma. They don't know. Is death annihilation? Is it not annihilation? What happens? What is there of lasting value in this life that might be able to survive death? They're in doubt about that, so the whole thing is a big mystery, and when it's a mystery, it's scary. A Brahmin once went to see the Buddha and he said he didn't think there was anybody in the world who wasn't afraid of death, and the Buddha said that there are people who are not afraid of death. They haven't done anything cruel, they're not attached to the bodies, they're not attached to sensual pleasures, and they've ended their doubts about the Dharma. So this is an important aspect of the practice we're doing is to learn how to practice so that we can overcome our fear of death. This is the way in which the Dharma offers a refuge. We often think of the Dharma as a refuge as something outside. The the words written in the books up here in the bookcases. And that's an auxiliary refuge. The real refuge, though, is when the Dharma appears inside. When we practice the Dharma, having listened to it, then we practice it, and then we attain the Dharma. So it's in developing this refuge inside through the practice of virtue, concentration, and discernment. That's what ultimately offers our truest protection, and it takes us beyond fear of death. Of those four reasons for fear, one of them deals with our outside behavior, the way we treat other people, other beings. This is what the precepts are for, that you follow the precepts and then you look at your behavior. And realize this, you've done nothing to harm anybody, so there's no fear from that quarter. Even then, though, there's a possibility you might start thinking back on the things you did before you took on the precepts. And if you have no control over your mind, it's very easy to focus on all the cruel and harmful things that you did. So ultimately, d meditation deals with all four. One, bringing your mind under control so it doesn't go wandering off into things that are harmful and hurtful. It's important to remember that is when the Buddha talked about precepts, he talked about karma. He says, thinking back on the bad things you did in the past is useful only when you take it as an incentive not to do those things again. If you do it and start getting tied up in remorse and guilt, he said, okay, that's not helpful at all. No matter how remorseful you are, you can't go back and erase what you did. And the remorse actually weakens your mind so that you don't have the strength to refrain from actions like that in the future. So this requires a certain ability to gain some control over your thoughts. This is why we practice concentration, to keep the mind on one object and give it something good to hold on to so that it doesn't feel tempted to go wandering off and feeding in its old ways. So when you find the mind wandering off, bring it back to the breath. If it keeps wandering off, then look at the things that you're wandering off to feed on. Look for their drawbacks. When anger comes up, ask yourself, why are you angry? What do you get out of it? And you look at it with a fair mind, you realize you don't get much. And it's certainly not all the, worth all the trouble that it causes the mind. 
And what would happen if you let yourself think those thoughts of anger for 24 hours? Well, it just eats away, eats away at your mind at the same time. You get more and more likely to do and say things that you're going to later regret. And sometimes that realization is enough to help drop the anger. If that doesn't work, you can consciously ignore the anger. Think of it as being one voice in the committee of your mind. And let it be in the back corner. Don't put it on front stage. In other words, you know it's there, it's chattering away, but you just decide you're not going to focus there. If that doesn't work, notice how when you're thinking, it's, there's tension in the body. It's tension in the mind. It takes energy to keep thinking about things. If you can notice where the tension is, where the effort is, just relax it. Especially if you can sense where in the body there's the tension that corresponds to the thought. It's going to zap the tension, breathe right through it, and the thought doesn't have any foundation. It collapses. If that doesn't work, as the Buddha said, grit your teeth, press your tongue against the roof of your mouth, and just determine you are going to crush down any thought that has to do with that anger or whatever the distraction is. It's the steamroller approach. These are the five main ways of dealing with distractions. And so avail yourself of all of them, whichever one is needed at any particular time. This way you gain some control over your mind so it doesn't go wandering off into things that are harmful. It gets ready to settle down here, and it finds a state. It's able to develop a sense of ease while being in the present moment. You can adjust the breath to any way you like, so it feels good to be right here. And adjust your focus so that it's not too heavy, in other words, clamping down on the flow of blood in the body. And it's not too light, that it's easily blown away. You get a sense of just right, and that's the beginning of a sense of refuge inside. You have a place in the mind where you can go. And if you, even if you don't get any greater insights than this, at least you've got something to hold on to. Because when death comes, everything is going to get snatched, snatched, snatched away. What will remain will be just a sense of bare awareness. And the closer you can bring your mind to that sense of awareness by making it still, by keeping it bright and clear in the present moment. So when other things get snatched away, you don't feel like you're being snatched away or anything really valuable is being snatched away. So that provides a lot of protection right there. And it's even better when you've reflected on the body, reflected on your sensual pleasures that you're so attached to. This is why we have that chant on the 32 parts of the body that everybody complains so much about. If you hold on to the body, then when the time comes to part, it gets messy. Even before you part, look, the body gets messy anyhow. You get old, this can't function, that can't function. You can't even wipe yourself. If you're lucky, you have other people to come and care for you, but then you depend on their moods and their, their sense of frustration that they have to look after you. If you don't have anybody, you, you lie on your own excrement, and it's miserable. So it's best to learn to get some detachment from the body while you're healthy, while you're strong enough, to realize that although the body is useful in many ways, you can't hold on to it as an end in and of itself. And again, when you get a greater sense of the mind as being separate from the body, the awareness is one thing, the body is an object, and the stronger you make that awareness, the more continuous you get a sense that it really is separate. The images of a drop of water on a lotus leaf. Have you ever seen lotuses in Thailand or in Asia? 
They have these tiny, tiny hairs all over the lotus leaf. You put water on it, and the hairs are so small that the water can't even seep into the leaf. It just rides as a bead over the top of the, the top of the hairs on the surface of the leaf, so that the awareness is like the drop of water. The body is like that, the lotus leaf. The awareness just doesn't seep in. That makes it easier to stand apart from the body and all the sufferings it inflicts on you. You still have that sense of awareness. That's your valuable possession. You hold on to that. The same with sensual pleasures. You learn to look at them, especially if you've got a state of concentration going in the mind. You look at them and you compare them. The ease and well-being, the sense of fullness that comes from being concentrated as opposed to the tension, the grasping, the hunger that comes from keep grasping after any sensual pleasure you can find. You compare them, and after a while you get a sense of dismay, a sense of deta detachment. As this grows deeper, you get thoroughly disenchanted. It's a good exercise to read all the Buddha's similes on sensual pleasures. He said it's like a dog gnawing on some bones. It gnaws on the bones, hoping to get some meat, but the only nourishment it gets is its own saliva. Or they compare it to a drop of honey on a knife. Or a crow that's gotten a piece of meat, and other crows come to grab it and tear it away. Those are things we do in order to hang on to sensual pleasure. It really put us in a lot of danger. And the amount of real gratification we get from them, well, where is it? The sensual pleasures you had last week, where are they now? As your powers of concentration get stronger, you get more and more disenchanted with these things when you reflect on them. But the most important of the causes of fear of death is uncertainty about the Dharma. You haven't reached the deathless yet, so it's still a question mark. It's just a concept. Was, did the Buddha teach? Was it right? Was it right only for his time? Is it not right for ours? Was the path he taught there the right path? Did he leave anything out? As long as you haven't seen the deathless inside, death is going to hold a lot of fear. But once you practice to the point where you've gained insight into the pro mind's process of fabrication, learn to take it apart to the point where there is no intention in the mind, what's left is the deathless. It's there. When you see it, you realize, one, the Buddha knew what he was talking about, and two, he also taught the right way to get there. You follow his teachings. You look at what you did. This is important. Some people talk about awakening experiences where they don't know what happened. Suddenly, bang, they were going through all kinds of turmoil inside. This, was eating, this issue was eating them up, that issue was eating them up, and then one day everything just fell away. There's a great sense of relief, but they don't know how it happened. That's not an awakening. That's technically that's called a neurotic breakthrough. And that's not what the Buddha was talking about. When you reach awakening, you know how you did it because you have to understand the principles of intention and action in the mind. Enough so that when there is no intention, you know it. There is no intention because you're thoroughly familiar with intention of all kinds. This is why awakening is not just a spiritual accident. You sit around waiting for the accident to happen. That's not the case at all. It comes to a thorough understanding. This is why the Buddha said discernment is part of the path. You discern how intentions shape your experience, and you also discern how you can refine them to the point where there are no more intentions. 
That's the point that ends all your doubts about the deathless, all your doubts about the Dharma. And that's when your refuge gets really secure. The refuge that's based on concentration is not all that certain. Some people find that they can maintain their powers of concentration through the difficult indignities of aging and illness and death. Other people find that they fall to pieces. But the death deathless is not affected by that at all. So that's when your refuge is secure. As we're practicing, we're moving in that general direction, trying to create a refuge that's more and more solid, more and more secure, a place that we can stay when everything else goes crazy. And if at the moment of death all you've got is concentration, well, make the most of that concentration. That is your refuge. You can hold on there. That is the safe place. Because the quality of your mind has a large influence on where it's going to go when it leaves the body. So you make use of what you've got. But if you have the time, you keep working to see if you can reach the refuge that's more secure. In other words, you can't be complacent. But in either event, it's, it's a lot better than being a person who just doesn't have any idea of how to find refuge within at all. So many of us identify with our bodies. When we die, it's like we're being pushed out of the only thing we know, something that we've hold, held on to for a long, long time. And it's scary. When the mind is put in a position like that, it'll grab onto anything it can find. And for the most part, if it hasn't been trained, it just grabs onto well, who knows what. But if you've been training the mind, you've at least got something to hold onto as a refuge. It's important that you trust in that, you have faith in that. When you've tasted the deathless, it's no longer a question of faith, it's a question of knowledge. You know you can hang on here and be safe. You reach full awakening, there's no need to hang on to anything at all. So do your best to find this refuge inside. Work on the virtue that protects you from having memories of cruel things you've done in the past. Work on the concentration that can help pry you away from your attachment to the body, your attachment to sensual objects. And work on the discernment that ends all your doubts about the Dharma. That's the way the refuge in the Dharma moves from something outside to something that's right here, right now. And it's with you at all times. So even when death comes, there's nothing to phase you.